Morning, everyone. Welcome again to those who were on the call at 10 to the climate change litigation and rate to net zero conference. Um, we've got uh, two speakers this morning, Harriet Townsend and Sam Parks, who will speak in the reverse order, that which I've introduced them. Um, you have, if you have any questions you would like us to try and get to, use the question and answer um, function at the bottom near the central of your screen, and we'll see if we can get to them before the end of uh, this morning's lecture. Um, so to begin with, um, Sam, can you click to the next slide? I'd like to, because I think I may need a mouse. Yeah, it's going to be Alex. Um, slide problem. Sam, can we move the keyboard? This is going to be quite good. All right, great. So here, Sam is going to talk to us about international litigation and the challenges for decision makers. And Harriet, fresh from her appearance in the Supreme Court, is going to talk about the implications of Finch and the government strategy for net zero. Um, I'll introduce Harriet more fully in a, well, just before she starts talking, but Dr. Sam Files is already a distinguished public lawyer with a broad range of interests, but one particular one is climate change. If you look on the Chambers and Partners, it will say that he's the sort of advocate who makes you want to give a spontaneous standing ovation. So luckily we're going to be spared that this morning, although Harriet and I may be inclined to, to join in. So Sam, over to you. Oh. <laughs> James, thank you for um, that. Uh, introduction that will not at all be impossible to live up to. Um, I'm uh, going to try to cover two um, areas uh, this morning. This, I notice I'm, we're, we're very fortunate that we've got a uh, an audience that uh, spans professionals with various different interests in, in how climate change might might impact. So I'm going to try and go from the the global to the local, beginning by looking at. Uh, climate change duties and litigation at the international level, um, and then bringing that right down to the local level uh, to look at how those various duties impact on the decisions that have to be taken about planning uh, various different planning applications. Beginning then um, with the with the international developments, um, there are two really key uh, international treaties, and this is by no means uh, going to be the sum total of international climate change obligations. I'm just going to give you the, the headlines. Um, the, but the two that I want to highlight, uh, the first is the Paris Agreement. Um, and this is, this is an agreement um, very well known, but perhaps less well understood. The headline, of course, is that uh, nations of the world agreed to reduce uh, emissions, uh, reduce global heating to two degrees below pre-industrial levels. Um, but what that actually means, what that requires them to do, uh, is a little less clear, um, because the way the Paris Agreement works is it requires um, all of the different signatories to submit their own uh, what are called nationally determined contributions. Um, and whereas the requirement to submit a, a nationally determined contribution, the NDC, is um, mandatory, the content of that contribution is voluntary. So it relies very much on the goodwill of states um, to, to make a, an, an NDC that is going to make an impact and to um, to the UK's credit, as we'll come on to, the UK has, has taken that duty very seriously. Um, the, this sort of ambiguity at the, the heart of the Paris Agreement um, led to the, the Glasgow Agreement, the necessity for that. And Glasgow was um, publicly very much a, a recommitment to the, the Paris goals, but it also um, involved commitments to phase down coal, um, for wealthy countries to provide climate finance to less wealthy countries, and um, it was also an opportunity for various states to to make these uh, these NDC pledges in a, in a in a public forum. 
what then was the UK's response? Um, well, the first thing uh, to note is that the, these are not all of the UK's commitments, um, but I think they are possibly the most important. Uh, the UK went beyond the bare minimum in, in its MDC and committed to bringing emissions down uh, to 68% uh, below 1990 levels by 2030. Um, this is, of course, emissions at the national level. Um, in 2022, the UK updated that. It didn't make a more ambitious pledge, um, but it did uh, provide a lot more detail um, on how that 68% reduction um, meets its Paris obligations um, and, uh, and, and how that it, it intends to achieve that. Um, in addition to the Paris commitments, the UK has made, made a uh, and potentially even more ambitious commitment in the Climate Change Act when it amended section, the government amended section one um, to make a, in theory at least, legally binding pledge um, to get to 100% uh, below the 1990 baseline by 2050. Now I say this is a legal commitment because it appears in statute, um, but I want to give a caveat to that. Uh, because it's a legal commitment that is, as many have found, and we'll get onto that, rather difficult to enforce. Um, not least because it's, it's very broad and it's a long way in the future. So where uh, another public law duty um, that perhaps the courts are more used to dealing uh, with is gives a very specific um, thing that the government has to do or the government has to achieve in the immediate term, this is much more difficult to enforce because you're not you're not dealing with something that needs to be done now. You're dealing with something that we need to get to in the long term, and that has caused uh, a lot of problems for, for anyone that's tried to try to enforce this as sort of hard law. So I think perhaps if we're thinking about um, this as a as a tool, as a, as a legal tool, or as a decision making aid to think of it more as a material consideration in practice rather than as a hard duty. That's where the UK is right now, but things might change because the international picture is changing quite rapidly. And there's four cases um, that really illustrate this. Uh, the, first, uh, the first three are before uh, or about to be before the European Court of Human Rights. And the first is called Kilmer Seniora. And this translates, I believe, as the elders. Um, and it's, that's because the claimants are a group of elderly people who allege that they have been unlawfully discriminated against by Switzerland's response to climate change. Um, they say that as elderly people, they are more uh, vulnerable to the extremes of heat uh, that will be caused by climate change. And so Switzerland's failure to address that is discriminatory and they demand emissions cuts um, that go beyond Switzerland's current 34% uh, commitment and up to 60%. The challenges of this case are quite obvious. The European uh, Court of Human Rights has dealt with uh, human rights in the environment before, but only in a, a limited um, localized environmental harm context, not in a climate change context. Um, so, Certainly, on the face of it, they're asking the, the ECHR to take a step. Um, whether that uh, step is simply a matter of applying existing commitments, uh, ECHR commitments, to a new set of circumstances, or whether it's creating new commitments, which would, of course, go beyond what the ECHR can do, is yet to be determined. The second ECHR case is called Carene, and this is about the French MEP. Um, now, Mr. Kareme, or Monsieur Kareme, had uh, some success in climate change litigation before the French administrative court, um, and actually succeeded in getting a court order forcing the French government to step up its, uh, its response to climate change. Um, but he says he's also personally impacted by climate change because he lives in a place that is vulnerable to flooding. And so his case is about whether people, uh, whether we can identify people as individual and specific victims of climate change. And the significance of this is, is obvious, because if he were to succeed 
so that it could open the doors um, to a lot of cases against government with very, very specific remedies um, where governments are forced to essentially provide some sort of remedy to individuals in response to their, their particular um, victimhood flowing from climate change. The third ECHR case is called Agostino, and this is about the intergenerational impacts of climate change. Um, it's brought by six young people against 32 European states, including the United Kingdom. And they say that the, the, these states lack of or inadequate action on climate change is discriminatory against young people, um, essentially because young people are going to have to deal with the impacts of climate change to a greater extent than anyone else. That's not come before the court yet, but it's, uh, it's making its way there. Um, and again, it has the potential to uh, really change the way that governments have to look at climate change. The final international case I wanted to mention is uh, Vanuatu. And this uh, uses a United Nations mechanism, which allows the UN General Assembly to make a reference for an advisory opinion to the International Court of Justice. And so Vanuatu has already had a huge success here in that it's, it's run a very effective diplomatic campaign to get the votes at the UN General Assembly and get this reference made. But that's only the first stage, of course. It now has to con uh, convince the International Court of Justice that the larger or Western states have a duty of care uh, in respect of climate change to smaller states which suffer more severe impacts. And Vanuatu is a um, paradigmatic example of this. It's an archipelago nation um, that is not only at risk of almost disappearing with the predicted sea level rises from climate change, but is suffering uh, significantly enhanced extreme weather events as a result of climate change. Um, this opinion will obviously be advisory only, um, but it will that will nonetheless be a significant, I think, political um, factor. Uh, encouraging states to be even more aggressive in addressing climate change. Where does that leave the UK government? And more importantly, where does that leave people seeking to enforce the UK government's obligations? I'm aware of the time, so I'm going to, when I'm, uh, I had two cases for you on this, and I'm going to focus on one and just flag the, uh, the second for you. Um, the one I'd like to focus on is uh, Fred, Plan B, Friends of the Earth. Now, this concerned a number of different environmental issues, and I'm just going to focus on one, which was the role of the Paris Climate Agreement in domestic law litigation. And what the claimants in this case said was, well, um, the government, and the, the, this concerned the government's airports statement, the Secretary of State airport statement in re relation to Heathrow, and there was a, a duty in making that statement to have regard to government policy um, or relevant government policy. Uh, the claimant said, well, clearly this is, uh, the Paris Agreement is relevant government policy um, because the government has ratified it and said that it's going to um, abide by its obligations. And the Court of Appeal agreed. The Supreme Court, however, took the opposite approach. Um, and there was a, a various, this is only one of several reasons why the claim was dismissed. Um, but it's important because the Supreme Court essentially um, expanded or hardened, perhaps, the dualist principle. The dualist principle ordinarily is that um, international treaties aren't binding unless they're incorporated um, by an act of parliament. Uh, the Supreme Court sort of took this, took the hardest version of this and said it's not just they're not binding unless incorporated. They're not relevant as policy, or, and, or at least this treaty was not relevant as policy because it wasn't incorporated. So it's not just about whether it's binding, but whether it's a material consideration. Um, I flagged the, uh, the Friends of the Earth uh, and uh, the Trade Secretary case because that's, uh, that's an, another case dealing with um, uh, in the incorporation of international treaties or the dealing with unincorporated international treaties. Um, and I'd encourage you to have a look at that. Uh, the other case I wanted to, to flag is the Bristol Airports uh, case. And I could have 
put any number of similar cases in the place of, uh, of Bristol Airport, um, because it's a, a good example of the way that courts have dealt with the government's climate change targets. And the simple point here um, is that the courts uh, tend to allow decision makers to look at these targets at an international level, uh, at a national level, I should say. Um, so rather than saying, uh, asking, is, is, the, uh, is the emissions or are the emissions from this particular development going to make it more difficult to reach this target? Um, they say, can the target still be reached, notwithstanding the, these uh, emissions? And that gives decision makers a lot more leeway. Speaking of decision makers, how do these all impact on people that have got to make planning decisions at the local level? Um, well, at plan level, when you're making your plan, it's very clear in the, um, the various obligations are on the screen that the plan has to um, provide some sort of roadmap towards both mitigating climate change, i.e. cutting emissions, um, but also adapting to climate change, i.e. finding a way um, to deal with the likely impacts, flooding, excessive heat, etc. cetera. Um, but that's a plan level. At decision level, um, there are, it's a slightly different approach. Um, and there's uh, various obligations to, uh, the, for example, assuming the need for renewable energy. Um, but the general approach is that as long as the plan as a whole is delivering, then it's not 100% necess necessary for every individual decision to deliver, notwithstanding those specific commitments. So this, however, brings us to a bit of a conundrum um, because you have, in many cases, climate change or duties to address climate change pulling in one direction and other planning duties pulling in the opposite direction. And there's a couple of examples uh, on the board. Large scale renewable energy in the green belt is quite a common one. Um, how do you address this? Well, quite simply, go back to basics. Um, and I've put uh, the Cornwall case on the uh, on, on the slide, um, not just to curry favour with uh, with James, who was on the winning side in the, in that case. Um, but because it provides very helpful guidance on um, how to address um, policies and duties that pull in different directions. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to uh, just give you the headline. And the headline is perhaps best expressed by the next case, which is H.J. Bax. And that is, it's a question of balance. It's OK for policies to pull in different directions. The decision maker's job is to, uh, is to balance the different competing harms and the different competing benefits. Um, so if you are approaching this, uh, approaching a decision saying, well, I've got climate change duties and that dictates my decision, well, that's going to be the wrong approach. If you're um, uh, approaching your decision saying, I have climate change duties, these need to be weighed against the countervailing duties, and I'm going to use the Cornwall case met, uh, met matrix as an approach to that, when it, then it's likely that your decision will be sound. Um, the, uh, a, help, a helping hand uh, for some of those decisions uh, comes from uh, the uh, administrative court's decision in Valero. Um, I'm only going to touch on that very briefly, but the headline point is that uh, it's legitimate for decision makers to rely uh, to not put themselves in the shoes of alternative regulators. You can rely where the Environment Agency or another regulator um, in Valero, it was actually the uh, Civil Aviation Authority, where they have statutory duty to regulate a certain issue, and that might include emissions, you're entitled as a, as a decision maker to rely on them to discharge that duty. Um, and that brings us back then to the weight to be given to these climate change duties. 
there's an increase, and I wanted to finish um, on this because there's an increasing trend I've noticed um, for uh, submissions before uh, planning applications, but also before planning inquiries to major on the Paris uh, Agreement and to major on uh, the, the various um, climate change uh, reports, for example, coming out of the, the, the UN and from coming out of the Climate Change Committee. Um, and I think this is an approach that should be treated with a degree of caution. Um, first, the Supreme Court has already treated it with a degree of caution, but also because it's in, in order to address climate change, it's not necessary uh, to take the Paris Agreement as your starting point when you're a local authority planning decision maker. Um, in many cases, the NPPF has already charted a route through for you. And whereas the Paris Agreement is an international uh, agreement and at the uh, local level is a bit of a blunt instrument, um, the NPPF paragraphs 153 to 158 and the planning practice guidance uh, is a much more detailed um, and specific roadmap to discharging your duties. Uh, so you can get you can get to the the end point that the Paris Agreement presumably wants local authorities to get to, without uh, but by using local policy and using national policy rather uh, than uh, using the sort of hammer sledgehammer of the the Paris Agreement as your your starting point. Um, in the next few slides, I'm providing a few, uh, a couple of suggestions on how to how to do that, um, and I'm happy to answer uh, questions on it. Um, but I think at this point we need to, to move on to the main event, um, which is what, what everyone is, is here for to talk about, talk about finish. So I'm going to hand back to uh, to James to introduce that. Thank you very much, Sam, and thank you for that uh, quick run through, very illuminating run through on. Uh, international obligations and the approach to courts. Just to reassure you, um, you don't need to worry about taking notes. The slides will all be emailed to you following this morning's uh, close of play. So um, you can concentrate on the speakers to remind you of the question and answer series. But if none of you come up with any questions, I've got some up my pocket, in my pocket for Harriet and Sam. Um, and then uh, let me introduce Harriet. Harriet Townsend is a leading planning environmental law practitioner uh, with a particular interest in climate change and has been representing Surrey County Council in the Supreme Court in the case of Finch, which she will tell you more uh, in a moment or two. Uh, she's described on her website as methodical, intuitive, composed and sharp. And with that introduction, um, I've never seen the sharp side of her, but uh, <laughs> I hope you will stay on the right side of her. So over to you, Harriet, and um, tell us about Finch. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, so as, as introduced, those two key points, uh, but the two cases that I'm going to focus on are just two of the many cases globally in which the law is being used to influence the way society manages what we may call the impact of human activity on the environment. And I'll start by um, referencing this very interesting um, and not unduly long report by Joanna Setzer and Catherine Hyatt, the Grant Research Institute. It is fascinating and in it, they identify key trends in climate litigation across the world. Uh, they call the growth in climate litigation since the Paris Agreement explosive. And if there needed to be another any reason, there needed another reason to be involved in this space uh, legally, uh, I think that provides it. So let's get to the point. Finch. So this slide gives you in very short summary uh, the uh, background facts of the issue. It concerned an application for, uh, for judicial review of the decision to grant planning permission for commercial extraction of oil, that's crude oil. The environmental impact assessment failed to assess the impact on the climate of what I'll call combustion emissions caused by burning the fuel that is manufactured from the crude oil extracted by the development permitted. And the essential question by the time the case reached the Supreme Court was, does the statutory scheme 
require a decision maker to assess the combustion emissions before granting planning permission. And that turns on the simple question, difficult to answer, simple to pose, are those emissions indirect effects of the development on the climate? And that bottom bullet on this slide gives you uh, a little of the, of the facts uh, in more detail. Just note that the county council whom I represented had in fact initially asked for an assessment of those very combustion emissions. When the ES failed to do so, for reasons expressed in the ES itself, they agreed with the developer that uh, ultimately, since the emissions were not effects of development, they would not require assessment. So that's the background. Uh, what was the state of the law at the time the Court of Appeal uh, produced its judgment on the 17th of February, 2022? Well, it was a split decision. The majority, Lindblom and Lewis, uh, deciding that, well, sorry, all deciding that the question of issue was one fact and valid to judgment for the authority, but uh, the majority deciding that that uh, task had been discharged lawfully by the council in this case. And the senior president saying at paragraph 41, uh, what needs to be considered by the authority in that case is the necessary degree of connection that is required between the development and its putative effects. Complicating things slightly for the council at least, Lord Justice Moylan dissented, although he agreed with the majority approach, that is to say he agreed that the question was one of fact and a value to judgment for the authority. But reflecting the fact that he, uh, he took the view that essentially the oil was the key thing to focus on in the project because it was all about the commercial extraction of oil. It was the end product uh, and he was unhappy effectively with the quality of the reason uh, when the council decided against uh, requiring its assessment. Now I've underlined on the slide the words the end product because there was considerable debate over what is the end product here because it's because of its use in a different case, Abraham and Wallonia, which I'll come on to in a moment, in which uh, the end product of the works was actually the operation of the project. Moving on to the next. So very briefly um, in terms of the um, the arguments and what was agreed. Uh, the thing to focus on in this slide is that it was all agreed that the question for the court was one of statutory interpretation and that one should take a broad purposive approach to the construction of the directive and regulations. The parties differed uh, in terms of what, what effective the EIA directive's purpose is in this regard. Coming on to the different arguments, and I'm going to take you through the different arguments because there were so many, so so many of them, so many different arguments made, and uh, really to prepare for the decision when it comes, which will uh, uh, need somehow to uh, to deal with all these these different approaches. And some of the detail may be lost in the actual judgment. So the appellate was saying. The question whether a change to the environment is, effect, is an effect of development is one of law. It's only questions of likelihood and significance, which, is, which are part of the test in, or part of the requirement for assessment in the regulations, which are questions of judgment. <clears throat> Where development is the extraction of hydrocarbons for commercial purposes, the emissions caused by combustion are indirect effects of the development. Simple as that, that encapsulates the appellant's case. And the reasoning for it include the fact that those combustion emissions are inevitable once the oil is out of the ground. 
and the appellant also prayed in a 200, 2014 directive amendments to the EIA directive, uh, which emphasized more, uh, more clearly the importance of assessing impact on climate. An additional argument emerged in the Supreme Court, uh, namely that it is inconsistent, says the appellant, to take account of those emissions as a material consideration, but to fail to assess them as an effect of an EIA. In a written intervention, the Office of Environmental Protection uh, supported the approach of the appellant. And I'm going to leave this slide at, as written for, for you to read, uh, not go through it in detail. The most significant point I think to take away here is the mere fact of the OEP's intervention. They have a power to intervene in judicial review, but only where they consider that a failure to comply with environmental law would be serious. Uh, this was their first intervention uh, and does indicate that the seriousness with which they take not only this issue, but also their role more generally. Also supporting the appellant were Friends of the Earth and Greenpeace, and I've summarized very briefly the way in which they uh, added, as, as was really necessary, if they're putting in a written intervention, they try to say something additional to that of the appellant. And I've highlighted some of the additional points they make on this slide. Coming to those opposing the appeal and my client, the County Council. The County Council say the majority in the Court of Appeal are right. The question is one of fact and evaluated judgment subject to review on public law grounds only. And they say that this is entirely consistent with well-established authority dating from Blewett against Derbyshire County Council. And recently, that, that case recently endorsed and that approach recently endorsed in the Supreme Court in the Friends of the Earth case just referred to by uh, Sam. The County Council also says that we can find in case law no support for appellants, for the appellants approach. Uh, all the cases that she relies on, uh, we distinguish. And we say that the County Council says that identifying effects requires a project centric focus on the project and its use, but not on the use of a commercial project product following sale on the international market. The County Council says the 2014 amendments do not alter this basic proposition, and there is no inconsistency in reality, since it's not the greenhouse gas emissions that are material considerations, but climate change policy. Supporting the County Council are Horse Hill, but they uh, prefer the approach of Mr. Justice Holgate at first instance, which I haven't said anything about uh, yet, but Mr. Justice Holgate held that the climate impact of combustion emissions are as a matter of law, not effects of the development. So agreeing with the appellant that it's a question of law, uh, disagreeing with the appellant as to the way in which that plays out. And then the Secretary of State, uh, and I'll focus on this a little, uh, because the Secretary of State uh, supports, the, it can be seen clearly to be on the different side to the OEP, which is going to be a matter of some interest when we read the final judgment. Secretary of State agrees with those resisting the judicial review, and in their written case, uh, really made the same points made by the County Council in support of the argument that the majority of the Court of Appeal were correct. Interestingly enough, in oral argument, uh, and the Secretary of State was the last to go, so perhaps, perhaps uh, the advocate, Richard Laws, uh, felt that a test was going to be needed, that the, that the court needed something a bit more. Uh, who knows? But uh, for whatever reason, he shifted towards the Horse Hill position. He said, although it's a question of fact and evaluative judgment for the decision maker, it would in fact have been Wensbury unreasonable 
for the county council to require an assessment of the combustion emissions in this case. They are so far removed from the project uh, at hand. And council posed the following test, this test for in identifying effects of development, namely, is the effect one that the construction, operation and use of the project has on the environment? Uh, just by way of comment, that is very close indeed to uh, Mr. Justice Holgate's position. West Cumbria Mining uh, supports the uh, uh, respondents uh, and uh, just to be aware, uh, without going into any detail of what they say, uh, this is the company that proposed development of Whitehaven coal mine, which was granted permission and is now the subject of a World Up application for judicial review. Uh, and that is likely to occur after the Supreme Court have decided Finch. Uh, another reason why Finch uh, will be of some significance immediately. And so um, from what was said by whom to uh, the implications of this case for practice, whichever way the case goes, it, it brings profound implications in my view for practitioners. It is, if nothing else, a wake up call to take climate impacts seriously and to establish principles for how to handle them in environmental assessment. And if that doesn't come from the top, it will increasingly come from litigants. There will be a lot more litigation. I make essentially six points over the next two slides, uh, touching on, and there's only time, of course, to touch on, on some implications for practice. My aim is to make you think a little and reflect on these points. Uh, 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 at some length. So the first, um, EIA has, perhaps until now, required a close focus on the effects of the project itself. Uh, consider uh, the Abraham case, which was front and center of the appellant's argument, but concerned the extension of an airport runway. The essential question was whether the noise arising from the additional air traffic that would give rise to that, that the development would give rise to required assessment. And the ECJ held that the EIA had to assess not only the works which comprise the project, but the end product of those works. Hence the importance of that phrase, end product, and its application to the crude oil, which, in, which is said by the appellant to be the end product of the project in Finch. Uh, you may know uh, the Preston New Road case as Frackman. This was a proposal for fracking, the exploratory phase uh, in which the Court of Appeal held that you don't need to assess the uh, uh, impacts of the next phase of uh, that uh, development, should it happen, focusing on the specific project. Also quite interesting holding that the the emissions caused by the gas extracted as part of emission extended flow testing in this very phase, in the exploratory phase, uh, would uh, would be we would be part of the um, of the general supply, and therefore wouldn't add to the gas or the the emissions caused. An interesting point which may need uh, looking at again. Uh, and in Bold West, laws, Lord Justice Laws held that uh, the later development of, 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 of um, so the first development in the landfill project, um, what, which would open the way to a later development, much, much larger. Uh, did not need to assess the impacts of that later development. Um, so the scope of the island being a question of judgment. So the first bullet there, the main point being that the uh, approach taken in those cases and a host of others may change following Finch. Watch this space. 
second view is the appellant has sought to confine the implications of her argument to hydrocarbon development. I'm not at all sure that's possible because the words used in the, in the directive and, uh, uh, and regulations do not make a special case of fossil fuel development projects. So uh, whether or not that's possible, um, we will have to see. Uh, third, if the emissions require assessment, so if the opponent succeeds, we know that they may occur anywhere in the world, and we don't know when. In those circumstances, how does the practitioner go about assessing their impact? How is their significance to be judged against what metric? You've heard already from Sam that in the UK, emissions caused by, de by development occurring within the UK uh, are permitted to ignore the local carbon budget and look at the national carbon budget. But if we've got emissions that may not affect our carbon budget at all, is the appropriate metric the global carbon budget, so to speak? How is their significance to be judged? That, that will need real care and, uh, and some guidance is needed. And as I've already uh, fleshed out in the, in the points I made uh, uh, in relation to the cases I've, I've already referred to, potentially the Supreme Court will mandate a reversal of the current approach uh, as exemplified in this very recent case uh, which actually James drew to our attention out on Friday. Um, thank you, James. A recent judgment of Mr. Just Justice Thornton, statutory challenge to the grant of a DCO for three road proposals. Uh, and in terms of cumulative effect and the adequacy of the EIA, uh, the court has taken the uh, conventional approach. So, on to the next slide, the second of my slides um, on implications for practice. You may, you probably should, if you work in this field, be familiar with the fact that the Regulation 18 of the EIA regulations requires the ES to be based on the scoping opinion, if there is a scope. Uh, and it, in this case, there had been, uh, as I mentioned, and uh, a, a change in uh, a change of, of view uh, occurred following the submission of the ES. Uh, so, bearing in mind the ways in which advocates, uh, lawyers, and the courts have scrutinised those two paragraphs of the ES, I uh, do recommend that. that uh, the rationale for uh, any changes to a scoping decision uh, require great care. Now, there's no statutory re need for reasons, but uh, the, the rationale may well be scrutinized. And, and then finally, um, there are a, a long, there is a long list, there are many areas uh, for focus in training. Right? plucked a, a few from the top of my head. Uh, as the climate becomes a more and more prominent area of the focus, do, uh, do understand the terms downstream and scope three emissions. These are borrowed from reporting obligations, uh, which uh, are framed in, in, in a very different context. The terms are very broad and embrace a wide variety of sources of emissions. So the bottom line is take care with climate terminology. Um, second, uh, bear in mind there is some EC guidance on integrating climate change into EIA. It's fairly long in the two. Uh, my view is there's likely to be more um, coming down the line. Uh, how soon that comes up. I don't know. There's other sources of guidance as well, um, which uh, uh, I don't have time to go through, but um, you know where to find us. Consistency. So if the county council is right that, uh, that 
the approach to take to uh, indirect effects is one of judgment for the authority. The public law principle that decision makers act consistently or explain the reasons for the, explain their departure from a previously consistent line of decision making um, is one to watch. So be aware of the approach taken by the Secretary of State um, and yourselves if you are planning authorities uh, and do bear that in mind. And lawyers uh, inform themselves of relevant cases from around the world on the assessment of climate impacts. So that that is Finch, and I um, I've just been reminded of the time very properly. But I it, it was always going to be the bulk of my uh, talk. Uh, I'm going to move now to client Earth and the net zero strategy which was successful, sorry, the judicial review applied to a successful judicial review of the net zero strategy um, last year has, of course, led to some material changes. So in the last few minutes left, I'm going to give you some, just a, a few facts to update you with regard to that. So first of all, what is the net zero strategy, legally speaking? Well, section 14 of the Climate Change Act 2008 requires uh, the, the government to lay a report uh, before Parliament uh, after setting each carbon budget. And this was the report laid after setting carbon budget six, which runs 2033 to 37. And in their judicial review of that uh, report, uh, the claimants were successful uh, and uh, obtained a declaration essentially due to its lack of essential detail. Following which, in March of this year, the government published a document called Powering Up Britain, the Net Zero Growth Plan, uh, which it is uh, otherwise called the Carbon Budget Delivery Plan, uh, which contains the missing detail. But do note, the Climate Change Committee's progress report to Parliament in June, so very, very recently, recorded its concern that the prospects of meeting carbon budget six are even weaker than they were a year ago. So the Climate Change Committee is, is not happy with the weight of progress. And despite the publication of that document, which was welcomed by them for lots of reasons, they continue our confidence in meeting the NDC and sixth carbon budget has decreased since last year. This is driven by a combination of delays in action leading to increased deliveries. Uh, and the extra detail allows for a more thorough assessment. So enables them to see how, uh, how difficult it's going to be. And no surprise, Friends of the Earth, Client Earth, and the Good Law Project have sought judicial review of that delivery plan. Then, so, um, a couple of slides on what the CCC's progress report says about particularly the planning uh, system. One of nine key messages is planning policy needs radical reform to support net zero. You can't get much clearer than that. And I'll lead you, lead you to read the rest of that slide. Are policy changes coming down the track? Well, we know that the government intends a review of the MPPF. Perhaps this is one reason that we don't know when it's actually going to appear, because they've got some a job to do. And I've underlined um, a key part of this paragraph at page 27 of the report, land use and agriculture remains one of the few sectors where the government has not set out a coherent strategic approach to call policy to ultimately to the land. This is vital. And then the next few slides, which I, I'd love you to uh, just got the carbon budgets there and provide some uh, further reading, should you be so minded um, with that. That's my talk. Very much, Thank you very much indeed, Harriet. And we'll come back to finish in a moment. 
we've got um, a couple of questions which we'll try and deal with um, first. Though. Uh, first one is uh, from Ingrid, who asks, what's the status of the Glasgow Agreement in the UK context and any utility at all in a legal policy argument? And secondly, any thoughts on the parallel interaction of a number of bodies and um, uh, danger of inconsistent outcomes? So I'm going to ask Sam to touch on that very briefly. Sure, great. Well, I, I, it's a really good point um, because I think and I think the starting point for understanding the Glasgow Agreement status um, will probably be the Paris Agreement and the, the Plan B case and how the, the Supreme Court has, has treated that. And uh, certainly if reports are correct that the government is, uh, is going to roll back some of the commitments it made under, under Glasgow, um, particularly the climate aid pledges that it made, then clearly the, the government doesn't uh, uh, think, thinks it's got that, uh, that room for manoeuvre. Um, but that said, I don't want to leave you um, with the impression that it is uh, climate litigation in relation to these is now completely off the table. Um, there is definitely scope for, for legal challenges. Firstly, taking, this, uh, taking um, Glasgow and, uh, and uh, Paris, but also looking at the, the Climate Change Act and uh, using these as material considerations. And there is a possible chink as well in the in, in the armor of the the position on the on Paris and the, the and a hint that the Supreme Court's position may be changing slightly, um, because in a non climate change related case, which was actually um, the a reference from the Advocate General, um, sorry, Lord Advocate of Scotland, relating to the Scottish government's power to um, hold an independence referendum, uh, the. Um, the Supreme Court, contrary arguably to what it said in, uh, in Plan B, had a very, very serious look at various unincorporated international obligations relating to self-determination. Um, so perhaps that signals an evolution in the, uh, the Supreme Court's uh, approach to the, the to unincorporated treaties since the, the Plan B case and a properly put case on Paris or Glasgow might be more successful um, than, uh, than they previously have been. Thank you, Sam. Just to one follow-up question that's just come in from Angus. Can I ask Sam if any of the cases you mentioned, I presume he's referring to the European and Vanuatu cases, have implications for those of us practicing in the UK? So if I can ask you to give a very brief answer to that. The very brief answer is the ECHR cases, definitely um, the UK courts are still required to take the case law of the, um, the European Court of Human Rights in, into consideration. Um, so yes, if those cases, um, uh, depending on, of course, on what the, the European Court decides in, the, in those cases, they will definitely be relevant to, to domestic practitioners. Um, I think the impact of the Vanuatu case, if Vanuatu was to win, will be political more than they will be um, more than they will be legal for, for domestic practice. Um, so I, I think probably we're looking at seeing, seeing the impact of that at a parliamentary level rather than a court level. Thank you, Sam. Right, I'm going to ask my question about Finch and, and, um, and, and join a, an additional question from Ralph Cox. So my question to both of you on Finch, are: what will the court decide? What should the court decide if it's different from it will decide? And would that change the established approach? Will it change the established approach to climate change litigation that both of you have been talking about? And um, I'll add in a fourth question is, would the government be able easily to resolve this issue through the forthcoming ERR regime, making it clear whether downstream or upstream emissions will be a national um, environmental objective and therefore material to the decision? So Sam, to you first. Well, I'm uh, definitely taking the fourth question first because it's by far the easiest. And, and the answer is yes, this is uh, the, the whole issue in Finns, in, in my view, is arguably a question that the government or certainly Parliament should have should have addressed and, and resolved. And uh, if Parliament brass the nettle, then it could really solve all our all our problems on this. Um, in terms, and that, that kind of feeds into my, my answers to the, and I'll, I'll leave question three to Harriet because I think she's the best place to answer that, but questions one and two um, feeds into my answer to those in that 
Um, I hope Parliament putting the court in a difficult position is sort of the reason we have a public law legal system, I suppose, and that Parliament le leaves an ambiguity and the courts have to try and figure out a way for uh, for ordinary people to uh, to work, work their way around it and, and apply it in, in real life. Um, so I thought, I think the court has been placed in a, with a fiendishly difficult um, decision to make here. Um, I, perhaps looking at the way that this, this Supreme Court has dealt with, with previous, um, previous controversial issues, I think it's more likely than previous courts to want to leave this up to Parliament um, rather than finding a, a legal solution. Um, but I also am duty bound to say that the argument on both sides of this case were incredibly strong. And I would, uh, uh, and put by incredibly strong advocates, so I, would, I would hate to uh, make a final choice between them. So, um, Harriet, aware of your role in the case, yeah. um, what do you think the court will decide? What should it decide? Well, we know what you think it should decide. Um, and is it likely to have any implications on practice? So, um, and like Sam, can I take the fourth one first, just very quickly? Um, <clears throat> I have. I have real difficulties with the EOR in its current, um, with the, the ambition for it and the lack of detail in it. But of course, as Sam says, the government could make the law clear uh, and should, in my view, uh, have a more coherent, uh, more ambitious approach to requiring, to hydrocarbon development and to requiring and to the assessment of, of activities which ultimately lead to uh, downstream emissions. So very possible, could do it, current progress with the EOR and massive ambitions for it uh, without any detail, concerned that the, the nipple will not be grasped. And so when it comes to the outcome, that leads directly to the outcome for Finch, um, which I do think, although um, one particularly uh, vociferous member of the panel was uh, appeared to be antipathetic to uh, the argument I was running, despite that, I think that ultimately um, it, 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 the court will be uh, will be more conservative uh, and stick to the line of, of, of reasoning that um, was recently endorsed in the Friends of the Earth and, and Heathrow case. So um, I think we'll win. Um, it may be a split decision. Um, and on the state of the law as it is, yes, the, the appeal should be dismissed. The Court of Appeal got it right. That is what EIA, as it is currently drafted, is for it is to assess the impacts of the project and its use and to leave in the hands of the decision maker subject to public review um, the the ability to determine what information they need to make a good environment great thank you very much both of you i'm going to draw it to a close um dennis clark um, has asked a very interesting question about if plan permission is granted in breach of Regulation 3 uh, and no EIA is carried out, does the development become lawful if no BJR is it? And how does that affect um, obligation of SEER cooperation? That is a question worthy of a lecture, probably for a couple of hours as a whole. Um, short answer is if no BJR is the decision, it will be lawful. Um, but uh, the implications of that and the um, consequences. Uh, um, and the um, status of decisions, which um, may be flawed but nobody's judicial review, um, are very interesting. It's very interesting. So, so um, uh, well, very short yeah, time. Sam wants to put up. I, do, I just wanted to, as a closing point. We've we've been very clear uh, th this morning on the, you know, the the limitations that the courts have imposed, and and finish us off by saying we really like Parliament to grasp the nettle. I didn't want, given that we've got a, a large number of environmental professionals and lawyers in the in the virtual room, I, I didn't want to leave the impression that um, this sort of litigation is a is a no go. If Parliament doesn't grasp the nettle, our job as lawyers is to figure out a way to to carry on 
um, and, and to, to discharge our obligations and to, for everyone to do their jobs. Um, so climate litigation is still incredibly important and there's a huge amount of potential to it. We just have to figure it out, but that's our job, that's what we do. Um, lastly, I'm afraid Estelle um, from Cornerstone who asked a question, very interesting, again, another topic. How do you think an overarching requirement that all planning decisions must be given, taken, given full regard to the imperative of net zero would work in practice is, is, a, is another very interesting topic worthy of another lecture in itself. Uh, interesting aside, the Scottish uh, most recent framework uh, does have a, um, uh, almost an overarching requirement to that end, but we'll see how that works in practice. So I'm going to draw that to a close. Harry, can you? Can I just say, isn't that effectively what the Climate Change Committee is asking for? Um, and yeah. I'm on my slide. I think we'll 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 have to part that one. But could you move on to the next Enjoy slide? Next week. Absolutely. <laughs> can, we move on to the, can we move on to the next slide? Because before I, oh, yes. It, yes, I just to wait. remind you, Cornerstone Climate, which um, perhaps oh. back one. Um, which uh, is cross disciplinary practice group um, uh, center of excellence. It's a it, if you go onto our website <clears throat> under expertise, it's the first topic, and we there assembled um, uh, uh, some resources on climate change, including such <clears throat> talks of as interesting as why buildings are not like vegetables <laughs> by Estelle Dehon and and uh, um, and Rhoda Clapp. And a very interesting article on climate change litigation um, from only the 19th of June, again by Estelle Rowan and Asta Ranatoma. So, can I encourage you all to have a look on that? Thank you all for attending this morning. Thank um, Sam and Harriet. I didn't hear a round of applause breaking out anywhere close by, but I'll do that. <laughs> <laughs> and um, remind you all, you will be getting the slides and new Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thanks.